All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be here with you today. I hope you enjoyed uh, the singing this morning. I was enjoying it. And uh, those last couple of hymns uh, written by uh, faithful men, written by reformers who stood up against um, false doctrine, stood up against the evils of the devil, uh, especially um, that hymn, How Firm a Foundation We Have in Our, in our God. And um, they sung about being willing to have the body killed and the body, um, their, their mortal life meant nothing to them, um, only that they would serve their Lord. And they were faithful. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, um, the opportunities that you and I have uh, to be faithful uh, in our life, uh, in our lives for, for God, for our Saviour. And if you would turn with me to the book of Luke, uh, Luke and, and chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, and we'll read a few verses here um, as we begin this morning. So Luke and chapter 12, and we'll read from verse 35. I know you just sat down, but if we would stand together and we'll read uh, the Lord's word together this morning, and then we'll pray. So Luke And uh, from verse 35, we'll read through to verse 48. Verse 35 reads, Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if if he shall come in the second watch, will come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord, delay of his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he, knew, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with, with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Uh, we thank you that we can be together in your house, um, saved uh, by your by your blood, and we thank you that we can look home, uh, forward to a home in heaven and uh, rejoice at the knowledge that you love us and, and you, uh, we will be with you uh, one day. We, we ask that you would challenge us today by your word and, um, and cause us to learn from you. We ask for the moving of your Holy Spirit in our hearts, each and every one of us. Um, help me as your speaker, I ask, and, uh, and teach us from your word, we, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seats and... This is a wonderful passage. The whole, uh, the whole chapter is, is the Lord speaking to his disciples and to us, um, I hope, as, as God's disciples this morning. And we're reminded here that uh, the, the coming of our Savior, the Lord's return, um, it's, it's not going to be too far away. It could be at any time. And this will be in the form of, of the rapture of the church. He'll, he'll take us uh, to be with him. And that, as we read there in verse 40, that will be at an hour when we think not. That is what our Lord tells us. It will be at an hour when you think not. Could be soon. 
could be in the next couple of days. Uh, it could be in still a few hundred years or even a thousand years. We don't know, uh, but it could be soon. And it will be in an hour when we think not. So I thought it would be a good uh, idea this morning to just spend some time re reflecting uh, on our lives um, for our Saviour, if we're saved today, and just to spend some time thinking if the Lord is to return um, any day, even this week, um, are we being faithful to Him? Are we ready for His return? And to think about what kind of servant we have been in our lives. Because in this passage, there's two kinds of servants spoken, a servant spoken about here. There's the, the watchful and the faithful servant uh, who's spoken of there in verse 37 and then verse 42 to 44. The servant who is waiting for his master re to return and he's been faithful with, with what he has been given, the job he has been given to do. And we're familiar with, with that idea. And then there is the neglectful servant who is spoken of in quite severe terms. Uh, the servant who is slothful and, and, and is confident in his, uh, that he has time and will think, ah, oh, is putting off almost the return of the Lord and refusing to, to think about the fact that it may be near and that he has a responsibility uh, to serve his master while he has time. That is the neglectful servant who is neglecting the will of God in his life. And there's warning warning there of, of punishment for that servant and, and also uh, the encouragement of reward uh, for the servant who is faithful uh, to his Lord in, in this passage. And there's that, that very powerful statement there in verse 48, right at the end of our text there, which says, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And this is something that um, we know that with that, that saying, with great power comes great responsibility, if you like, or it's, it's that concept. It's well understood that if you are given much, uh, you, there's an expectation that comes with that. And I think we can agree that we have been given much this morning. We are one of God's children. Uh, we can forget that, uh, but if we reflect on it and look back, we can agree that we have been given much. And so therefore, much is required of us. Uh, so if you, if you would with me today, let, let's just take some moments to, uh, to reflect on our lives and um, to, to be honest with ourselves and with God and to see what kind of servant we are. And we're going to look at uh, a word, and that word is opportunity. What opportunities have we missed? And what opportunities do we have now going forward? And what will be the cost of, our, of an opportunity that we d decide to take, to take up for our Lord? And firstly then, what opportunities have we missed? And, you know, this is the kind of uh, sermon, in fact, I, I preached this or a similar uh, message at a New Year's um, Eve service not too long ago. And um, it's, it's a good thing to reflect on at the end of a year and at the beginning of a new year. But really, if you want to think about it, any day is the end of a, of a year period and the beginning of a, a, a new year. So it's important at any time to stop and to reflect and to look back and to say, what have I been doing for my Lord? And, and what word would be used to describe our lives in, in the, maybe the recent past? And you can set the length of what you, will re, what you will reflect on. Maybe just the beginning of this year so far. We're nearly through two months already. Um, it's gone so quickly. And how, what word, if we were to pick one word, would we define that as success, successful so far? Or uh, has it been profitable? Has it been disappointing, perhaps? Hopefully not. Um, has it been joyous? Um, has it been faithful, is what I'm aiming at. Have we been faithful so far this year? Or have we been neglectful? What are our priorities? And what have they been, if we look past? What were our priorities in the past year, two years, or so on? And what opportunities, importantly here, what opportunities have we all had that perhaps we have missed? And these are not opportunities in our careers or anything that is that might be good, but that's not what I'm aiming at this morning. I'm, I'm thinking about what opportunities has God given us to serve Him that perhaps has just gone straight over our heads and we've, and we've missed. What ministries have we been involved in? Uh, these might be numerous and, and many, I'm sure they are. But have we, have we used every opportunity that has come our way to share the gospel? 
I know I can tell you right now that hasn't been the case for me. It's somehow the hardest thing to hand out a tract uh, to the person you're buying your lunch off. It's the hardest thing to do, even though it's the simplest thing to do. But what opportunities have we missed to share the gospel? Have we done everything we can be to be a faithful servant? That's the, the reflection I'm hoping we can, we can go through this morning. And I know this to reflect can be very confronting sometimes when we, we stop and think. It can be very confronting to think of, uh, I'd rather just maybe not think about what I missed out on in the past week or two weeks. Um, but our Lord, our Lord wants us to reflect and to be faithful to him, even if we might realize that we could have done more for him. But equally, it might, reflecting might cause us to be quite joyous and, and happy as we look back and seeing what the Lord has done through our life um, and what he promises, uh, sorry, that what he has promised has, has come true um, and he has been faithful to us. And there's an example of reflection in the scriptures I'd like us to just have a look at in, in 2 Timothy, not far away from our memory verse and 2 Timothy chapter 4. And our memory verse refers to how Paul has taught faithful things to those who have listened to his preaching and been under his ministry. And he is commanded and, and exhorting them uh, to go on and to teach those principles and those truths to the next generation, to more faithful men. And so Paul had that on his heart in, in this book, in this letter he's writing in 2 Timothy um, to his, his protege. And this is, we know, the last letter Paul writes before he goes to be um, in glory. Um, and, and so he's at the end of his ministry here and, and he's reflecting on what has gone past in his life. And so in here in chapter 4 and verse 6, we read, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. That is a pretty good track record if you can get to the end of your life and say, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've been faithful. That's not Paul being arrogant. He just knows that he has used every opportunity to serve his God and to put the priorities that his Lord had for him to put those first. And he's looked back on his entire life of ministry and he said, I have fought a good fight. He used every opportunity that came his way. And we know that from what the scriptures tell us about Paul's life. He was a faithful man, and what an example. And he had great joy, although he had been through so much suffering. He had great joy to reflect on what the Lord had done through him. And so I ask you again then, how would we remember our recent, our recent past or our entire life if we want to, since we were saved? How would we remember that and reflect on what we have done for God? Much has been given to us. And much is required. Sadly, in this same chapter, we see an example of a missed opportunity, missed opportunities for God, missed opportunities for service. And, and that's if we go down to verse 10 here in 2 Timothy 4, and, and we read, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessal Thessalonica, uh, and so on there. So the, the key phrase there is that Paul is saying, Demas, this man who has served with me for so long, he's forsaken me. And, and key there is that, why? Why did he forsake Paul? Because he loved this present world. Not every early church figure, um, the, the heroes of our faith that we read about, not, a, not all of them went on and were faithful their entire lives right until the end as Paul was. And Demas is mentioned a couple of other times um, in Paul's letters in, in Colossians and in Philemon. Um, and he's ref referred to as one of the several men who very faithfully served alongside Paul and, and went through the same afflictions that Paul went through and the same journeys and uh, gave up what Paul gave up, gave up their lives uh, to serve their God. But sadly, at the end of, of Paul's ministry, Demas has, has left him. And, and by extension, Demas has left his service for God, the place in God's will that he knew he was supposed to be. And of course, the, war the warning is not that he, he has left Paul, but it, the warning is that he has loved this present world. 
He, cho- he chose this world over, over service to God. And we don't know why Demas left. Maybe it was a family issue. Maybe he missed his job. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe he just wanted to, to go home. Uh, maybe he was sick of traveling and he wanted a more restful lifestyle. And, uh, but we, we can infer that uh, he, left, he left his ministry um, because he thought it was more important to live for himself and to, to serve his own needs. And, and it's a sad tale there. He missed a golden opportunity. Um, he, he had been able to serve with Paul. I think everyone here today would say, if we were given a chance to go and meet Paul and to serve under him, um, we would probably take it, right? Um, he's one of the examples of the scriptures. But Demas had been with him for years and missed that opportunity to continue on serving with Paul. But he missed the opportunity to remain in God's will and to remain faithful until the end. So what opportunities have we missed? What have we neglected in our lives that perhaps we should have been doing for our God? Have we had that moment where there was a fork in the road uh, where we could spend a Sunday morning in church or um, a Saturday afternoon encouraging someone or, or a Saturday afternoon just spending some time, taking some time out for ourselves and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But did we, we choose the option that was selfish and loved this present world over serving our God? What opportunities have we missed? Have we neglected our calling at all and gone and pursued something else? Now, many of the things that we go and pursue, there's nothing wrong with them and they are good to study, to work, to provide for our family, to... Um, to enjoy, enjoy this present world, to enjoy this life. There's nothing wrong with that at all, and our Lord gives us that liberty. Um, but have we put that before and prioritised those things before serving our God? And that's the challenge this morning, and I hope uh, we can reflect back, and, and that is not the case in our lives. But if it is in some area, I think all of us can say there is something we can do more for our God. And so there is an opportunity present for us today. There is an opportunity that we have each of us before us to serve in a greater way for our Lord. We know that the Lord is returning sometime soon and we know that there is much still to be done. Uh, the gospel is still live. It is still saving. It still needs each, each of us here uh, this morning to use every opportunity we have to, to spread the good news of the saving knowledge of our Lord. It's still powerful in a world where we we look around us and we like to talk often, don't we, about how things are are going badly, it seems, and uh, just getting worse and worse and worse, and they are, and that shouldn't take us by surprise. Uh, But the gospel is still powerful to save and to change lives. It just needs us to be willing to serve and to take that opportunity to serve. There is much opportunity for each of us as a child of God to be part of that gospel spread. But what is our attitude to those opportunities. Again, if we go back to the example of Paul, his life was, was a, an example of consistent effort for God to do whatever was necessary to win souls. And we can go to 1 Corinthians and, and read of a specific example here. If, if you would turn there, 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16 and, and verse 9. Paul saw an opportunity to minister as something that should never be passed up, that should never be foregone uh, for another purpose and for another priority. And here in, in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9, um, he is speaking to the Corinthians and he's saying, uh, verse 8 there, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. And, and you can read the context there and, and you'll see that Paul is returning uh, to Corinth uh, from Ephesus where he has been for some, some years. Um, and, and as he's returning and the Corinthians are waiting for him and, and expecting him to return soon um, and looking forward to his return so that he can minister to them. But he says, I'm going to go up into Macedonia first. He's going to detour. 
And a detour for Paul was not a couple of days, it was some months or perhaps years. Um, and so he says, I'm going to Macedonia first. And why? Because a great door and effectual is open there for the spread of the gospel. He saw an opportunity to minister, an opportunity to serve in a greater way, in a, a different way, but in a new place. And he said, I'm doing that. doesn't matter that you want me back in Corinth right now. And he wanted to be back with his friends and, and those he loved. Um, but he said, I'm going to Macedonia first because I know that's the Lord's will for me. And this was an inconvenience, uh, a change to his plans. He probably didn't have the finances lined up. Um, he probably didn't have everything. It wasn't the easy route to take for Paul and for those with him. It didn't matter, though. He said, I'm going to Macedonia. A great door and effectual is open unto me. He knew that there were many adversaries, he mentions there. He knew that with ministry opportunities, there will always come opposition. There will always be something in the way that will, uh, that will prevent from serving. But he was excited about this opportunity uh, to go and to spread the gospel in this, in this new place, the great and effectual open door open to him. And we can read through the scriptures and see the examples of, of Moses and of Daniel and David and all the, the heroes of the faith. Oh, I thought the wall was falling down for a second, but no, it was just a little knot. And all the heroes of the faith in the scriptures who, when there was an opportunity for them to serve, they took it and they were excited about it. And they put the Lord first in their lives. So I'll, I'll ask you again, again today, brethren, if we can consider what are the open doors in our lives to serve? What is there available for us right now? What opportunity do each of us have to expand our service for God, to minister more for our God? And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that we're not doing things. We are, each of us, serving and we're all busy. The fields are white to harvest. There are so few churches in our land, in Australia, and then in the whole world at large. There are so few works going on for our Saviour. There are so few people, when you think about it, who are seriously and diligently spreading the gospel. We are God's people. What opportunities do each of us have in our lives to serve more? Here in our church, even just small things, I'm not necessarily talking about becoming a missionary and going to uh, the heart of darkness in Africa and, and forsaking our family and leaving all that behind. I'm, I'm just speaking this morning about what's an opportunity to serve even in a small way in our church. There are ministries everywhere that, that need hands, that need willing hearts and hands, that need people to be willing just to do anything to serve our God. From cleaning the, the floors to preaching on Sunday morning to anything for our Lord, that nothing is of greater or lesser importance in God's eyes. He just wants us to serve willingly for him. What is an opportunity we have to expand what we are doing for our God? What might we add to our ministry list, if you like? And what is an open door for us? A great and effectual open door, as Paul had. There will be adversaries or adversaries. There will be things that get in your way. If you this morning reflect on your past and say, I could have done more and say, I want to do more, there will be something that gets in the way. That is promised in the scriptures. And, and we know that the devil wants to prevent you from serving. If you try to start to stretch yourself and, and serve more for God, just as there were adversaries to Paul, there will be adversaries for you. And I would suggest that it'll be a similar thing that has prevented you from serving in the past that'll prevent you from serving in the future. It'll be a similar thing that gets in your way and that shifts your priority. What is it that we can do to increase our service for God? And there will be rewards. We read of that in our text in Luke. I don't know what those rewards will be on this earth or the next exactly, but I know that the Lord promises to reward the faithful servant who does everything they can for him. Let's try and serve more. But if we serve, we're giving up something. And that is my final point this morning, that with every opportunity comes an opportunity cost. 
And if you're uh, at all trained in business, I'm not, I just happen to know this word, but um, if you've ever, ever done any business training, uh, you might have heard of something called an opportunity cost, right? And, and that's the a term that refers to if, if you lead your business in a certain direction, you're giving up what you could have done instead with that time. It's, it's if you're going to, if you're going to a cafe in the morning and you've got $5 left in your, as, in, as spare change, and you can either buy banana bread or a coffee, if you choose the coffee, as I would, uh, you're not getting the banana bread, right? It's one or the other. And so your opportunity cost is the banana bread. Uh, you're giving that up so you can buy the coffee. If you choose to spend your time doing something for God, you will be given something else up. There is an opportunity cost to service. And I think many people, when they make resolutions to serve God, they, they often fail at that resolution after a few weeks or a few months or whatever length of time because perhaps at the beginning they failed to count the opportunity cost. They failed to, to think about what am I giving up to make sure that I can do more for God? What am I willing to give up? What is the acceptable opportunity cost to me? Hebrews chapter 11, if we would turn there, uh, we read of an example of someone who knew the cost of his service to God and weighed it up and was willing to let that go because he wanted to serve his Savior. Hebrews chapter 11 and, and verse 23. One of the greatest chapters of the Bible, I think, it goes through all the great heroes of faith, the hall of faith, as you know, and uh, a great read. But just in, in verse 23 here, we read of someone I mentioned earlier, of Moses. And let's read, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ to greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he, en he endured as seeing him who is invisible." Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do, were drowned. So we read here of, of Moses, and we know the story, uh, but we read the wonderfully worded account of, of how Moses enjoyed for a time the, the treasures in Egypt. And he was, from, from nothing, made to be second in, in all the land. And um, I'm, I teach ancient history and we, we spend a lot of time um, studying Egypt, ancient Egypt. And specifically this period, it was, it was uh, most likely what's called the second intermediate period. And it was a time when um, there was a power in, e in Egypt, the, the pharaohs in control, um, and they had a lot of gold, they had a lot of riches, they were the world's superpower at the time. Um, they controlled the trade routes and so on. And they lived a life of opulent luxury. If you've ever seen anything about their tombs and what they left behind, even the most insignificant pharaoh, you can imagine what their life would have been, let alone their death. Um, they had anything and everything they wanted. And, and Moses was, was put as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Um, and, and he could have had whatever he wanted in his life, never have to lift a finger, never have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning to go to work, nothing, just a life of luxury handed to him. And yet we see that when he was come to years and could make decisions for himself, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose his God over luxury. He counted the opportunity cost here of his service. He, he saw the treasures in Egypt and the pleasures of sin for a season. And he said, no, I'm rejecting that in place of going and doing what I know God wants me to do, what God's will is for me to do. 
He was a faithful servant. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God, going through everything that we know Moses went through, leading the people out, going through the Red Sea, going through the wilderness, being blamed for everything again and again, and, um, and still leading faithfully, serving God faithfully, because he knew that's what God wanted him to do. And right at the beginning, we read here clearly that he knew full well the price of his servants, of his service for God, and he chose eternal riches and faithfulness to God rather than these temporary earthly pleasures. And verse 26 there is put so well, he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He knew the consequences is what that means. He knew the consequence of staying in Egypt and the reward that that would bring, but then in turn the recompense of that reward that he would face eternity outside of God's presence. And he knew that he needed to serve his God and to be faithful. And so he chose to serve. And we read of another man, not in the Bible, but you might have heard of a missionary uh, named C.T. Studd, um, very famous missionary. You might know his story. Um, and if you do, you would know that he was a famous cricketer. And uh, all good men are good cricketers. But no, just, um, I'm the only cricket hair, a fan here, apparently. But uh, no, C.T. Studd was from a very wealthy family in, in England in the 1700s. And um, he, his brother, George, who was also a very um, famous cricketer and they, they played for England together uh, with another, a third brother um, and they participated actually in the first Ashes series in history um, and they were famous, they had fame, they had riches, they had everything they, they could want um, and his brother George when they were at uh, Eton together in, in college uh, became extremely ill, um, we don't know how and he was on his deathbed, he was about to die, um, he didn't end up dying but they thought he would uh, and so Charles C.T. Studd was next to him and he realized, he, he said at that moment, that living for himself and the pleasures of sin that he had always lived for would lead him in perhaps a matter of days or months to his deathbed with nothing to show for his life. He'd already been saved for a couple of years. Um, and that story is another good one, but I won't tell it today. Um, but he'd been saved for a couple of years already. And yet that was the moment he realized he needed to do more for his God to take more of the opportunities in front of him to serve his God. And he went on to, uh, to minister in China and then in India and then in Africa um, with great success. And he started many churches and many thousands were saved under his ministry and in the missionaries that came after him. He took the opportunity in front of him and he ran with it. And he served his God to the best of his ability. And so us today, are we weighing up the cost of our service? Are we sat and thought, what have I done for God? I need to do more. What, what am I willing to give up? Perhaps it's a bit of time of just enjoyment and entertainment. Perhaps it's work and being able to advance in our job. Perhaps it's a degree or just more sleep. Perhaps it's waking up earlier on a Sunday morning or um, losing some time on a Wednesday night or losing some time on a Saturday morning to go to outreach. or All of these things are sacrifices, are things we need to give up. What is the opportunity cost of our service and what are we willing to give up today? Consider that if, if you would and consider what you want to spend your life doing. It starts with small decisions small decisions to serve more, and then the Lord will give you more to do, and your life will become one of success in service for God. Or we can choose those small decisions to neglect our service, to neglect our calling, and slowly but surely lose our place as a faithful servant of God. Our passage back in Luke, if we would end there this morning, it started with the uh, the couple of phrases there, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. We know the, perhaps the, the custom and the, uh, the practice in, in ancient Israel uh, to when you were getting ready for, for battle or something that was coming, you would gird up your loins or 
your garments in preparation to run um, into battle or into um, what was coming. Perhaps it was a weather event or uh, the call of your commander or something that was coming that you needed to be ready for. Let your loins be girded and your lights burning so that if the Lord returns tomorrow, you'll be ready. It won't take you by surprise. You won't be that neglectful servant who said, I've got time. I can just spend a couple of years doing what I want to do first before I get serious in serving and ministering for God. Elsewhere in Luke, and I close with this, in a, in a similar theme, um, Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples, he gave the command, occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Be faithful until I come, until I come, is what he was saying. We're going to sing about that if you would turn to your hymn books as we close, number 863. Number 863, and, and just notice the words there before we sing. We'll work till Jesus comes. We have work to do. We have opportunities to minister. Will we take those opportunities today, weighing up the cost of our service and willingly saying, we will work until Jesus comes and when we'll be gathered home. So if we would stand together, please, and we'll sing all the verses of we'll work till Jesus comes. On the first. Oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh, when will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. No tranquil joys on earth, I know no peaceful shelter in home. This world's a wilderness of woe, this world is not my home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home. I sought at once my Saviour's side no more, my steps shall roam. And reach my heavenly home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, that we have the opportunity to serve you this morning, uh, that we know we have a home in heaven had to go to and, and the great joy and, and happiness that that will, will bring. Um, we thank you for the joy of serving you now and we pray that you'd help us to be faithful servants so that when you return, uh, we can be gathered to, um, to be with you, um, not at all regretting what we have done in our lives. And we pray that you would revive our hearts and help us to be faithful until you come. We commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.